see all of you and to kick off this semester's season of education now. So we'll just take a few seconds um, and we'll get started. All right, I'm seeing the numbers still increasing, but perhaps they're slowing down. I'm gonna give us about 15 more seconds and then we'll get started. All right, brilliant. Let us kick it off. So good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, as your time zone suggests. Um, my name is Uche Amechi, and I am a lecturer on education here at Harvard Graduate School of Education. And then, like I mentioned, I want to welcome all of you to today's Education Now episode. So if you all are joining us for the first time, Education Now is a webinar series designed to respond to the dramatic changes in the field of education in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. So in today's conversation, we're gonna discuss lessons learned from remote learning um, or still being learned and look at new innovations that can be harnessed to improve in-person instructions in K-12 schools, make up for missed learning and perhaps create more focused interventions for those who need it most. As usual, today's episode is being recorded and will be available to view on the Harvard Education Now YouTube channel and our Facebook page. You can visit us at hgse.me forward slash ed now for recordings and information about our future episodes. You can also submit your questions using the question and answer button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You'll also find access to closed caption there. Now, I am excited to welcome our guest for today, Saul Khan. Saul Khan is the founder of the CEO and CEO of Khan Academy, a nonprofit organization with a mission to provide a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. He's also the founder of Khan Lab School, a nonprofit K-12 laboratory school in Mountain View, California. He's also co-founder of Schoolhouse.World, a nonprofit that offers free tutoring over Zoom. And in his free time, he's the co-founder of Khan World School, a new nonprofit online high school. Wow, that's a lot going on. Welcome, Saul. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Uche. <laughs> Excellent. And where are we? Are you in Mountain View right now? I'm in Mountain View, yeah. Excellent. Anything you want to say quickly by to add to that introduction before we jump into questions? I think that was a sufficient introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. All right, let's jump right in. So my first question is really kind of your choice is, it's a new year, and um, I'm just curious, like, what is one or two innovations that you're most excited about in perhaps the teaching and learning or broader education space? Yeah, well, I think there's a uh, huge um, artificial elephant in the room <laughs> with, with artificial intelligence. <laughs> well um, played. Uh, you know, well I, played. I, think, I think it would be, um, I think everyone uh, is thinking seriously about that. And, you, you know, um, we, we, Obviously, ChatGPT uh, has has brought a lot of attention to it, and this is an area that uh, the Khan Academy team has been exploring even before ChatGPT. And um, you know, I, I I do think this is going to be transformative for obviously for potentially what platforms like Khan Academy can do, uh, but also transformative mm -hmm. for what education becomes. Mm -hmm. For I'm. I have my understanding of what Chat GPT is. Could you give us a little bit of a summary from your perspective for anybody who may not be following along or maybe following along and still confused? Yeah, well, first I'll, I'll tell you what the user experience is and then I'm happy to go to the <laughs> wonky as folks want to get for you know what, what's, what's the technology behind it. But mm -hmm. the, the, the user experience is, you know, if, if you go to Chat GPT, I know there so many people are trying to get a hold of it that their servers keep going down. But if, if you go on uh, mm -hmm. to Chat GPT, um, it, it, it's based on the third generation of the GPT, which is the technology, which is, you know, the large language model. And what's interesting is the like GPT two could write these like paragraphs, but they didn't make, but when you really thought about what it's saying, it didn't always necessarily make a ton of sense or didn't really have a decent grasp of facts. The reason why mm -hmm. um, chat GPT, which is using GPT 3.5 has everyone kind of both excited and scared at the same time is 
it, it does sometimes feel like you're talking to something that's reasonably intelligent. Um, it can mm -hmm. make errors. Um, it it um, sometimes hallucinates things. Uh, we could talk more about what what a, what it means for an AI to hallucinate things. But you know, most famously, uh, people have already gotten it. You know, you you can you can copy and paste your assignment for a paper, and it will write a good paper. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't do it on the first pass, you can give it more feedback. Hey, can you make this more whatever, or tighten up this part of this argument, or make it longer, make it shorter, make it more poetic, whatever you want to do. Um, put it in the style of. Um, and it can do it. And it's not plagiarizing. It's trained off of, you know, more human language than we could, than any one of us could consume in probably hundreds or thousands mm -hmm. of lifetimes uh, to create truly novel uh, new text. Um, and so you can imagine a lot of, you know, this has raised all sorts of questions about uh, what, what, what is what is the ethical use of it or not as a student? Does this change what you can do from a point of view from, you know, take home term paper writing, essay writing? What does this do for college uh, admissions? I've gotten it to write, you know, I pretended to be a student trying to get it to uh, write my college essays. It wrote very good college essays for me for, for admissions, <laughs> uh, which raises equity issues around like, hey, you know, what's going mm -hmm. on? You know, this is a, uh, everyone can have varsity blues now. <laughs> um, uh, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and so, um, that's that's the 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 user experience behind it, and I think what's especially scary and exciting for many folks is that these models are only going to get better and better and better. Uh, you know, when you look at the gap between what was out maybe two years ago and what we saw a few months ago, huge. And then you're like, wow, if it keeps improving at this pace every year, two years, um, it's not far that we're going to or maybe we're already there that the world that science fiction authors have been writing about for a very long time. I mean, uh, in a lot of ways, chat GPT already is, feels more intelligent than the, the computer on the bridge of star Trek. Right. So, so, um, no, most, th yeah. th this, this, this is, this is, we are in a brave new world. Yeah. I know that I've exchanged a few nervous laughters and jokes with some of my colleagues when talking about this. And even this morning I've read, an article about a Wharton professor who used ChatGPT to write um, a like a midterm exam and the ChatGPT would have gotten like a B or a B minus. I've also read how like, it's kind of an arms race. Well, maybe we can use ChatGPT to grade the papers if the students are gonna. So what are your thoughts on how this could impact say in the short term or even the medium term given like how quickly you feel like this technology is improving and perhaps being adopted or at least tested. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, some people took a knee jerk reaction. New York City Public Schools famously banned chat GPT. Mm -hmm. I think that's the wrong approach because um, uh, at the same time that they banned it, uh, there, you know, this one, this other uh, AI company, Anthropic, just yesterday posted a prompt engineer job posting that pays two hundred seventy five to three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. A prompt engineer's whole job is to learn is to be really good at getting the AI to do what you want it to do by prompting it. So should we be banning it for schools where this might be one of the hottest jobs of the future of being able to leverage this thing? So, um, but what it does say is like, okay. And, and I think anytime you have this type of disruption, inflection point, whatever you call it, it's actually a really good moment to think about like, well, what are we doing now? And what aspects of it are, do we think are really adding value? And what aspects of it are we're just doing mm -hmm. it because it's tradition? I remember when Khan Academy first came on the scene 10 years ago, um, and you know, a lot of folks associate Khan Academy with videos, but you know, most of our investment has been on personalized practice software that gives people feedback, you know, does mastery learning, et cetera. I, I remember um, a, a head of a, a school told their faculty that, and, and she told me about this, you know, what do you do that Khan Academy cannot do? And it wasn't a threat. It wasn't saying like, oh, this is gonna, it's like, no, if you think about it for about 10 seconds, there's all sorts of things that you as a human being in the classroom can do that Khan Academy at that time does not do. And then it helped distill in, in, in the teacher's minds, well, mm -hmm. wow, I can add even more value as an educator. I don't have to give the same canned lecture while the kids kind of pretend to pay attention. I don't have to move every student at the same time and pace anymore. I can actually mm -hmm. scale and have more personal connections, do more small group interaction, have more projects, more Socratic dialogue than I ever have because Khan Academy has got a lot of the content knowledge and a lot of the core skill practice going. Similarly now, I think it's, it's a really good thing for us to think, but okay, now what are the things that we want students to be able to um, showcase or develop? by doing things like writing a paper, 
uh, or writing an essay for college, which that's a whole other conversation mm-hmm. around college admissions. But um, and and you know, most people say, well, you know, we, we want them to be able to form an argument. We want them to critical thinking. We just want them to be good writers. We want them to be able to look evidence and and, and be able to cite those things. Um, and I, you know, th- this does introduce some logistic difficulties where it's going to be awfully hard for and tempting for students not to use these things, um, especially when they see their their peers using it and it's not detectable by plagiarism detectors. And honestly, I think in most cases or in a lot of cases, um, it's amazing for getting the writer's block out of you. You know, like it, it'll give you the first draft and then you tweak it and it, it, you might end up in a very mm-hmm. different place. I've already used it to help me write proposals for grants for, you know, people said, hey, Sal, that's an interesting project. Mm-hmm. Um, can you write us a proposal by tomorrow? Well, you know, was, okay, let me take a first draft, but then I, I ask it to tweak mm-hmm. it a little bit and then I keep editing it more. And then what, what I end up with is probably 90% different than what it came up with, but it's a, it's a very good accelerant. So I think we have to work on the logistics of just how do we make sure it's fair and equitable, kids quote, aren't cheating. If we really wanna make sure that it's their own work, I think there is gonna be more in-class or proctor type modalities uh, that become interesting, but there's, there's ways to do that. But I think the really powerful thing is this is just another tool. Just as um, when we went from typewriters to word processors, you could expect mm-hmm. more out of your students. They were going to be able to do a more ambitious project. Similarly, now we're going into the chat GPT or whatever world comes next. You can be more ambitious. I got my eight-year-old son to leverage it to help him write a story that he definitely would not have been capable of writing. It was it was you know a nice short story that any of us were like, this is a well-written short story, but it was an incredible experience for my eight-year-old son. He felt empowered. He felt like a writer. He felt like an editor. He ended up reading that story about eight times while he edited it. And even though it was probably at a high, slightly higher reading level than, than he was used to. So like the, the things that it engaged him with were, were incredible. Um, my, my daughter uh, co-wrote a story with, with a large language model and was able to have a conversation with one of the characters, right? This is taking us into a whole new uh, zone of of opportunity you know as these things get better are you going to be will they be able to act as a one-on-one uh, socratic tutor uh things like this things that we could have only dreamed of before so i i, I think that's the the really really uh exciting opportunity that as educators we have to be exploring very interesting um so i have a couple of thoughts so i'm hearing that instead of the knee-jerk reaction of change is hard or change is not necessarily negative, you're talking about partnership, partnership with the machines. We're gonna become somewhat cyborg, so to speak. And I heard two ways of talking about it. You're talking about doing things better with that partnership. So the same things that we're doing, actually doing things better because the machines can take some of the mechanistic um, rote stuff. But you also then towards the end started talking about doing better things. So like now we can learn new things that we weren't able to. And I know that that's kind of a framing that we do use here at the Ed School to perhaps help us engage with change. So I find that powerful. But one thing I heard you also say, you use the word we a lot. So I often think about what do you do at the in, like interpersonal level? What do you do at the team level, at the organizational level? So when you talk about we and we need to either learn more about the technology or figure out how to respond, who are you thinking about? Is this like something individual classroom teachers or is this like schools or do you feel like this needs to be a more system level um, response? I, I think for sure you're gonna have some really, and I'm sure it's already happening, some really creative mm-hmm. teachers and schools already doing some really fun stuff with this. And as, as the AIs get better, they're only gonna be able to do more and more things with it. But I think that's not going to be sufficient for you know, the great majority of, of the system, so to speak. And so, I, yeah, I think, mm-hmm. you know, schools of education, I think organizations like Khan Academy, I think it's our duty mm-hmm. to be on the, you know, on the, the leading edge of how do you make sense of this and what are use cases. And, you know, the whole reason why in that intro, as you know, I've started several lab schools now, including an online lab mm-hmm. school, is not just to start another school in the world, um, but to show how it can be used. Um, I expect at Khan World School and Khan Lab School in the next two, three months where this is going to be part of our day to day of, of the kids mm-hmm. having, you know, Socratic conversations with, with AIs or, um, or, or being able to leverage them to, to do much more dramatic things than they would, would have. I mean, we, we could keep going. I mean, think about a research paper. Uh, you know, I, I, mm-hmm. I, I often think about how, how much research, more research would have happened if 
One, if it was easier for people to write their results, and two, it was easier for people to consume their results. Well, this is a, this might be a mechanism, right? Give me that same paper, but write it like common language, right? Give me the essence of it, right? It's <laughs> like all of these things are are there. Um, uh, you know, uh, so so much of of term paper writing and even even things like master theses, uh, you know, are are, are or are, are like let's summarize what other people have thought, um, but not as much on the novel. Like, why don't you create a new experiment or why don't you do something new? Maybe this mm -hmm. can change the focus. But anyway, in terms of who has a responsibility, I, when I say we, it's you, it's me. It's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think we're, you know, and I think we have the best chance because a, a district or a, a policymaker on their own isn't gonna be in a good position. Excellent. And underneath everything I'm hearing you say, um, this reminds me, like, I think about five years ago, I heard of this app that kids were maybe interested in called Musical.ly, and I kind of ignored it to my, and then all of a sudden it came back as TikTok. And you can't, you're saying this is real, whether it's ChatGPT or whether it's something else, like this is something that we're going to have, to, like we're going to have to respond to. So I guess to all the educators out there, you're saying this is not a flash in the pan, maybe ChatGPT or now Microsoft and ChatGPT are not going to be what takes over but this technology is here to stay and we need to not react but respond would that be a good characterization of what you're saying yeah ev everyone who's close to it actually views the moment that we're in and not just chat gpt but there's there's at least six or seven that we know about organizations that are, are building large language models that mm -hmm. are improving very 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 fast um and so most folks feel that this is actually a bigger deal than the internet um, and it's going to happen faster. You know, I mm -hmm. talked to a um, a friend of mine who's a very prominent venture capitalist, and he's normally a very cool character, seems to have his act together, seems to know, you know, has theories about everything. And he was generally stressed that he's like, I think 90% of the companies in my portfolio are going to be disrupted by this in the next five to 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, it's not just education, it's everything we're doing. It's even what are the jobs of the future are going to be dramatically transformed by this. Um mm -hmm. So, so yeah, we, it's, 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 pe people should not hide from it. They should, they should play with it. They should embrace it and see, see how we can navigate the future with it. So you heard it here, folks, this is for real, whether it's chat GPT or something else, if Google is retooling because of this, this is something we should take seriously. I want to use this opportunity because I know I'm getting some questions about hybrid learning and remote learning, um, particularly in the um, shadow of the pandemic, which I Yes, we're still under. So I'm wondering, let me actually pick a question that I'm hearing and offer it to you and see what your thoughts are. Should schools regularly or always be providing hybrid or remote options for all students? And if so, what are some things that traditional in-person schools have to offer that you think need to continue to provide to students even if those students are learning remotely? Hmm, interesting, there's a lot, lot in that. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's valuable for students to have an option um, to keep learning if, for whatever reason, it doesn't make sense for them, you know, they're in a rural place, it's hard for them to get to the school, or maybe the school does not offer certain courses that the student would like to, to tap into, um, or, uh, you know, there's, there's a pandemic, or mm -hmm. there's a hurricane, or whatever it is, uh, think things... Um, or, and, and honestly, there's even situations we know in a lot of a lot of communities, there is, you know, what I would call homelessness with a lowercase h where, you know, it's not people on the streets, but they're living on couches, the family is moving from one family member to to another family member. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're switching schools, every time you switch schools, you have to, it's, you're starting from zero, you're falling behind. And so there's something powerful about the online mechanism to be able to stay with students, you know, we have refugees from Ukraine, from Syria, using Khan Academy as they go from refugee camp to refugee camp, it's able to stay with them. They don't lose their progress. When they go to the next, next refugee camp, someone says, oh, that's what you, okay, you've gotten mastered in algebra or you're 80% mastered. Okay, that's what I can help you with. So there's a lot of benefits for having what I would call this almost a safety net of, of online. It, it makes the whole system more fault tolerant, um, and more resilient. Um, I don't know whether I, I, I think it's hard for every individual school or even every individual district to be able to run in parallel. Now, maybe a very large district can do it, but then even then, you know, do they have the, the know-how to do it well? Um, 
is a question. So, you know, one of the things that we're exploring at, at Con World School is like, okay, can we start offering a la carte pieces of it to districts so that they could maybe not have to reinvent the wheel? It's, it's analogous to cloud services. You know, back in the late 90s, if you wanted to start a website that scaled, you would have to put literal servers into a rack and mm -hmm. have people walking around with beepers and all this. Well, no, no, now you call Google Cloud or Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure, and they, they have a lot of that there. Can Khan Academy, Khan World School, other resources be some of that cloud service that that districts, that teachers uh, can just, just tap into? In terms of what the in-person can offer that you cannot get, I mean, all else equal, I would always, if it can have the exact same experience, it's generally better in person. There's sometimes some advantages of online, like, you know, less friction of moving people around, um, mm -hmm. you know, putting people in breakouts on Zooms takes a lot less work than putting people into breakouts uh, in, in a physical classroom, uh, things like that. But, uh, you know, but the really powerful things are, uh, you know, creating, when, when human beings are together, how do you really leverage that human to human connection? How do you, how do you really make sure that they're mm -hmm. able to talk to each other, interact with each other? Obviously things like clubs, sports, um, mm -hmm. it's a lot harder to do those types of things remotely than, than doing it in person. So, you know, Con Lab School, it's an in-person school, Con World School is an online high school, but even there we're saying, hey, um, if, and we're trying to make that as interactive as possible. I think during the room, put that on Zoom becomes even more mind numbing. When it's on Zoom, it's extra imperative that it's a conversation, that you're, mm -hmm. you know, that you're, you're making an interaction. Uh, but, you know, even for Con World School, we're mm -hmm. trying to figure out if there's a critical mass of students in a certain geography, how can they meet up? How can they potentially do sports together? Or can they plug into other, other things in their community so that they can get um, some of that very important in-person time as well? Well, that's powerful. I know that like, I often think about it as what are the unique affordances when we're going online? Mm -hmm. And then how can that help us do things better or do better things? But you're actually saying the way you're responding is kind of like, what are the unique affordances of in-person? And you talked about it earlier when you were talking about like challenging the teacher to up their game when you've got these the plumbing or the infrastructure of online. So I think that's a helpful way to think about it. Um, can I ask you a slightly different question that's also coming up in the chat? So what do you see as the future of mathematical education? Um, and how does the Khan Academy think about it in terms of your lessons and your framing? Yeah, I mean, this is why I have a, I have a fairly strong opinion about this. Um, <laughs> I figured. <laughs> so so I'll tell you what, what tends to happen is that, um, you know, the, the system has seen gains in math and obviously famously, you know, from the, la the most recent uh, NAEP results, we lost, you know, all the gains for the last 20 years or something, you know, that's the stat that the, the news headlines were, were about. Um, but, you know, the reality is even with the progress we made even before the pandemic, at that point, only about a third of eighth graders were proficient in math. Um, and now it's about a fourth. Uh, when you look at what goes on, even the students who finish high school, graduate, then decide to go to college. So this is arguably the top 40 or 50% of kids in terms of completion. We know the national stats, uh, 70, 80% of these kids don't even place into college algebra, which is essentially high school math. They place into remedial math, which is essentially seventh grade math. So what happens is, and the reason why I believe this is happening is regardless of the standards, regardless of the textbook, which is what most people try to rearrange every time they're unhappy with it. Oh, let's look at the standards again. Let's look at this again. Um, regardless of what you look at, um, we have a system that just moves kids lockstep through it. And mm -hmm. you didn't learn your multiplication tables well, too bad. Move on to the next concept. You got a 70% on the exam on, on negative numbers, or maybe you got a 90%, but you forgot it the next month. So you're not really that proficient. But now all of a sudden we're expecting you to be perform well doing algebra. And the way that the system traditionally compensates to, to, to keep the illusion of progress is to keep watering down things as kids get further and further along. And then the first time that true mastery learning is being enforced is when they take that placement exam in college. And the college is like, wait, hold on a second. You took, yes, you took courses called Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Geometry. Some of these kids even took pre-calculus and calculus. And then the, the colleges are saying, wait, hold on a second. You're not actually ready to learn algebra yet. I, you know, I don't know what you've been doing the last six years. Think about the waste. Mm -hmm. Think about the, not just the waste of resources, you know, school systems are spending thousands of dollars a year on 
but from the student's self-esteem. They're like, what did I, yeah, what did I just spend the last? I wish someone just made sure I knew my pre-algebra really well in seventh grade, even eighth grade, even ninth grade. Um, uh, that I think is the crux of the issue. And and so if I if we were talking 50 years ago and I said, look, the solution here is let every student have the opportunity, the incentive to master their concepts, especially in math, because it's it's cumulative, which it, mm -hmm. it's kind of implies them being able to learn at their own pace. People would have reasonably said, well, that's impossible. There's one teacher with 30 students. How do you have them working at their own pace? Well, now you have tools like Khan Academy where you can have them all learning at your own pace. And we're seeing what happens. We just had a study, 200,000 students this was during the pandemic. The students who did 18 hours over the course of a school year, this was with the, uh, the NWEA, Northwest Education Association. Um, they, the eighth graders who, who got to 18 hours over the course of a year, which is about 30 to 60 minutes a week, they were big 40% faster than pre-pandemic norms. If you compare them to the peer group during the pandemic, they grew 70, 80% faster. Um, so and on one level, that seems amazing, but the other level is what I just said, like the average student in America is only getting about 0.7 grade levels per year, which is consistent with by the end of 12th grade, you're actually at a seventh grade mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. So you're getting 0.7 grade levels a year. If we can accelerate you by um, by 40 to 40 plus percent, then we get you back to your, you're going to get one, 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3 grade levels a year. Uh, at Khan Lab School, you know, this, the, what I'm about to say isn't like a rigorous study, but we are measuring our average, and it is, you know, the lab school, there's selection bias, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't want to pretend that you can replicate these results anywhere, but we're seeing it's pretty reasonable for, for, for students to see between one and a half and two grade levels a year. Um, and this is not a school that, you know, ask kids to take IQ tests. And we do have kids who are, who enter at the bottom quartile. Con World School, I, you know, I, I'm almost afraid to say the results. I put it on, you know, they're, they're seeing five times the growth. And this is for high school students because they're getting an opportunity to learn at their own time and and, and their own mm -hmm. pace and, and really master the concept. So to me, um, it's not just theoretical. It's, it's, there's, there's plenty of, of evidence behind this. Mm. So related to that, and this will be, I think my last question, this is also coming from the chat. What are your thoughts about equity as distinct from equality of access to, I would say perhaps, the hard technology, the soft technology, or even like the, we talk about resistance to change or resistance to new ways of thinking about things when we're talking about chat GPT. When we are talking about like, even the system that you're talking about, the response is based on technology, is based on facility with the technology and so on and so forth. So any thoughts for people who are wondering how can I either Get, bring this into my school, whether it be the technology or whether it be the actual mindset change that I think you're actually talking about. Yeah, you know, I mean, the technology one, that's a, a matter of, you know, uh, will and money. And, you know, frankly, during the pandemic, both of those things showed up uh, for on the, on the technology side. Uh, and, and, you know, we at Khan Academy are at the position to be able to give out laptops and give people free internet access, but we try to advocate for it as much as possible. And we saw school districts in the, you know, in the name of equity, especially during the pandemic, give out hundreds of thousands of laptops and, you know, get the providers to get free internet connection. And I, as far as I can tell, a lot of that stuff is kind of stuck around. So that is a really, really good thing. But we'll go further, we need to make sure there's a sufficient number of devices in the home that the parents are educated about, like, what's appropriate use of it. I mean, I, you know, like I have sufficient devices in my house, but I know if I'm not careful, my kids can easily <laughs> waste a lot of time doing some very, very unproductive things. Um, so, but, but I think that's where there's high leverage of investment. And then once that layer is there, you know, the, the digital divide for the most part, relative to when I was starting out with the Khan Academy stuff, it's improved dramatically in the school setting in the U S at least. And now people talk about the homework gap, which is really the digital divide at home, which the pandemic, ironically, or not ironically, the pandemic has helped. It's accelerated people say, oh, we got to get people technology at home. It's still not perfect, but it's improving fast. And then it's the awareness of like, hey, you know, there are resources out there. Even parents, like just get your kid on it 30 minutes a week. It's going to make a very significant, and by the way, it's free. And by the way, it's not profit. There's no ads. We're not trying to upsell. It's funded by philanthropy. Um, this can make a real difference in, in, your, in your child's life. I think if we, if parents got that message loud and clear, if they believe the message, they trust the message, then I think they're going to be the biggest advocates for uh, pushing this. And then, you know, I think in the in the schools themselves, 
you know, we, we, we started going to school districts about four or five years ago. We've always had a teacher, teacher tools, et cetera. And we said, look, a lot of your teachers use us. Look at the efficacy studies. How do we help all of your teachers, your entire district use this? And they said, you need to give us support. You need to give us training, integration. So there's all these muscles that we had to build and we're still building to be able to support that. We're, you know, we've created something called the Khan Academy District Offering, where we do the support, the training, the you know, implementation model, the integration with the assessments, the rostering systems, so some of the the hard, heavy lifting of, of running mm-hmm. a real district and a real school. Uh, but I think that's 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 the game that we we have to you know not be afraid of. Brilliant. And then last quick question. Any other advice? You mentioned the different stakeholders. We've got the teachers, school administrators, perhaps the districts, and you mentioned parents and family members. In terms of just helping students get be engaged, motivated, we talked about access, responsiveness, personalization. Anything that you'd suggest to these stakeholders to help students stay motivated and engaged in learning? You know, the simple one is the more that they can have agency over what they're doing, the more that they can, that that being able to interact with each other is not something that's shut down in the classroom, but it's something that's actually encouraged in the classroom. Um, that's step one. I think, once again, a lot of kids disengage because they might have so many gaps that the way of disengaging is just a way to pre- kind of preserve their self-esteem. Um, mm-hmm. Find ways to, so, you know, to help students fill the gaps or at least point them in ways that they on their own can try to do this. Obviously, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we exist as a non-for-profit for that purpose. And there's evidence. We have a partnership with Howard University right now trying to solve mm-hmm. the college algebra issue. We're going into Title I high schools. And we know what the numbers are when these kids would graduate. 60, 70, 80% wouldn't even place into college algebra. But now we're essentially replacing their their Algebra 2 class with a mastery-based pathway on Khan Academy called Howard College Algebra, and 80% of them are getting college algebra credit before they're even seniors, much less before they graduate, much less before. So not only are they not just placing into college algebra, they get college algebra done before they graduate from high school. Um, So, you know, we are excited about partnering with everyone here to just, you know, how do we get the word out more? How do we encourage just a little bit more leaning into um, so, some of the, so, so, you know, t- taking a few risks, t- taking a few chances. You know, I always say we, it's very in vogue right now to talk growth mindset to students like, oh, you know, failure's, failure's a gift. It's an opportunity you need to learn what you, and, and you're, that's when your brain goes. But as adults, sometimes we're like, oh, no, no, I, but I'm afraid of failure. I'm afraid of trying a new oh, curriculum. Oh, that's for the kids, or, not for us. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, that's for the kids not for us but and I, I do think that if you really want to teach someone growth mindset model it model it mm-hmm. by, by by showing that you're okay uh trying new things failing owning up to the failure reflecting on it i think that's a very powerful thing mm-hmm. for, for kids to see excellent thank you modeling creating the psychological safety that they feel like they can lean in mm-hmm. and perhaps learn as they fail mm-hmm. thank you so much Saw. i know we're a few minutes over Um, but this has been a fabulous conversation. I know there's a lot of questions we didn't get to, but um, I want to thank you so much. I think you've been extremely helpful and thoughtful and candid in your sharing. So thank you so much. Great. Thanks, everyone. To the rest of you, just a reminder that we will be posting this on our YouTube and Facebook channel, and you can also access this at agsc.me.ednow, and we hope to see you at the next Harvard Graduate School of Education, Education Now. Thank you and signing off.